Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on a beautiful Sabbath afternoon to study God's Word. What we've studied so far in our first two presentations are, number one, an introduction to Revelation 1 to 3, and then in our presentation this morning we studied about the Christ of Revelation chapter 1. This evening we are going to begin our study of the churches. And the first church, of course, is Ephesus. So we will be studying about the church of Ephesus, which is the apostolic church. But before we do, we want to ask for the Lord's blessing. So I invite you to bow your heads reverently as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne, and we come boldly because we come in the name of Jesus. We plead for your presence in our midst. Give us clarity of thought. Give us open hearts and the willingness to live in harmony with what we learn. We thank you, Father, for the promise of your presence. We claim that promise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The first thing we want to do is review the seven parts of the message to each church. In other words, the message to each church is composed of seven successive parts. Let me just mention those, I mentioned them in our presentation, our first presentation. I had to do it rather quickly because it was toward the end. But the first element that you have is the address to the pastor. In other words, it begins by saying, and to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, and then successively all the rest of the churches. That's the first element. The second element is a description of Jesus. And the description of Jesus fits with the condition of the church. The third element is the commendation that Jesus gives to the church. In other words, he praises the church for something good that is going on in the church. The only church that receives no commendation or no praise is the church of Laodicea, interestingly enough. And then in the fourth place, we have a rebuke by Jesus. In other words, Jesus tells the church what is not right and what needs to be corrected in the church. The censure or the rebuke is number four. Then number five, you have the exhortation. You know, after Jesus says this is what's going wrong, Jesus says now here is the way to fix it. Here's the way to make it right. Then number six, you have the common formula of all of the churches where it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then finally, the seventh element is, there's always a promise to those who overcome. To those who listen to the council and live in harmony with the council, you have the promise. Now I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter two and verses one through seven. Here we find the message to the church of Ephesus. This is the apostolic church from the year 31 to the year 100 AD. And basically, I'm going to read the passage and we're going to look for the seven elements in the passage. It says there, in the beginning in verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write. That's the first element, right? The address to the messenger of the church. Then comes the second element. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. That's the second element, the description of Jesus. Then you have the third element, which is, uh, continues in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have lover, labored, for my name's sake, and have not become weary. That's a rather long commendation, the good things about the church of Ephesus, the apostolic church. But then in verse five, we have, actually verse four, you have the rebuke. It says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And then you have the exhortation, Jesus uh, counseling the church to do something about it. Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly 
and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And then you have element number six, which is common to all of the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then finally number seven, you have the promise that is made to the overcomers. It says there in uh, verse seven, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So that is the message to the church of Ephesus. Clearly you have these seven uh, steps in each of the churches, and of course we've only noticed so far the seven steps in the message to the church of Ephesus. Now what we want to do next is take a look at the city of Ephesus. Why was Ephesus chosen as one of the churches in Asia Minor that illustrates the apostolic church? Let me give you some statistics about Ephesus. Ephesus was the fourth largest city of the Roman Empire, and it was actually the capital of Asia Minor. It was world famous for the temple of the goddess Diana, who according to Acts 19 and verse 27, all the world worshiped. The temple was massive, measuring 324 feet by 164 feet. And in the very center of this shrine was found an image of the goddess Diana. This temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it took 220 years to build this shrine, or this temple in honor of Diana. Diana was the moon goddess. The inscriptions from this time describe her as the savior goddess and the mother of the gods. Remember that because we're going to come back to it. They called her the savior goddess and the mother of the gods. She is depicted as a many-breasted woman with an infant always in her arms. It's no coincidence that in the year 431 AD in the church council of Ephesus, Mary was proclaimed by the papacy the mother of God. In Roman Catholic art, as probably those of you who have been Catholics or have visited Catholic churches and cathedrals, Roman Catholic art, uh, Mary is constantly depicted as a mother having baby Jesus in her arms. And she is also called by the Council of Ephesus the mother of God. The Temple of Diana brought thousands of tourists to the city. In fact, the city's commerce, industry, and economy depended to a great degree on the cult of Diana. Her followers practiced the arts of magic and astrology. As you know, the Apostle Paul had problems in Ephesus. You can read about it in Acts chapter 19 and beginning with verse 8. He got into hot water with, the, with uh, the Ephesians because he actually spoke against the superstition that the people were practicing there. We also know that the Apostle John knew this city very well. In fact, according to Polycarp, one of the church fathers, uh, John became the bishop of the city of Ephesus, uh, of the church in the city of Ephesus, when he was released by the emperor from the island of Patmos. And of course Ephesus is only about 60 miles away from the island of Patmos. So this gives us a bird's eye view of the church of Ephesus, and it will help us understand a little bit more the uh, specific details that we're going to look at in the message to the church of Ephesus. Now let's unpack some of the expressions that we find there in Revelation 2, 1, through seven that describe the church of Ephesus. First of all you noticed that we are told that Jesus, the description that is given of Jesus is that he walks among the seven candlesticks. Now what does that mean? Well I read a statement this morning but being that it is mentioned also with regards to the church of Ephesus I need to read that statement again about what it means 
that Jesus is walking among the candlesticks. Of course, Jesus is literally and personally in the heavenly sanctuary. There in the heavenly sanctuary I believe that there are seven literal lampstands. There is a candelabrum that has seven branches, and the candelabrum has oil in it. And Jesus has to make sure that the lights of that literal candelabrum never go out. But that literal candelabrum in heaven actually represents the seven churches symbolically in Asia. And then the seven churches in Asia become symbolic of seven periods of church history as we've studied. So what does it mean that Jesus is walking among the lampstands as we are told in chapter 2 and verse 1? I'm going to read from Acts of the Apostles, page 586. Christ is spoken of as walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks. Thus is symbolized His relation to the churches. He is in constant communication with His people. He knows their true state. He observes their order, their piety, their devotion. Although he is high priest and mediator in the sanctuary above, which was, is what we study this morning, yet he is represented as walking up and down in the midst of his churches on the earth with untiring wakefulness and unremitting vigilance. He watches to see whether the light of any of his sentinels is burning dim or going out. If the candlesticks were left to mere human care, the flickering flame would languish and die. But He is the true watchman in the Lord's house, the true warden of the temple courts. His continued care and sustaining grace are the source of life and light. So the walking of Jesus in the midst of the candlesticks means that Jesus is supervising His church throughout the course of human history in its different stages. There were some stages where it appeared that the light of the church was going to go out. That's why we have the dark ages when the Bible was forbidden from the, from the people. As a result the people to a great degree walked in darkness, but not total darkness. Because God had groups like the Waldenses and the Albigenses and others, John Huss and others, who never allowed the light of the church to go out. Now I want to read another statement that we find in Desire of Ages, page 166, where uh, Ellen White is describing this same thing in different words. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, He is still by His Spirit the minister of the church on earth. He is withdrawn from the eye of sense. In other words, we cannot see Jesus with our senses. But His parting promise is fulfilled. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. While He delegates His power to inferior ministers, His energizing presence is still with His church. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Because uh, even, you know, our own church is somewhat in disarray today. But Jesus is in the midst of the church of Laodicea. And He has His faithful individuals within the church of Laodicea. He is going to make sure that the light of the church never goes out. Now also we find in uh, the introductory verses to chapter 2 that Jesus holds in His right hand the seven stars. Now we talked about that in Revelation chapter 1 in our uh, previous presentation, but being that it's mentioned in chapter 2 with regards to the church of Ephesus, I want to once again read an interesting statement from the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy on the meaning of Jesus holding in His right hand the seven stars. We talked about the right hand this morning. Why is it the right hand? Because the right hand is the hand of God's favor, of Christ's favor. Judas was seated to the left of Jesus in the upper room. John, the beloved disciple, was seated at the right hand. When Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, He puts the sheep on His right hand, and the goats He puts on His left. And Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And so the right hand 
is the side of God's favor, Jesus has great regard for his ministers because the seven stars represent the ministers to the churches. They're called angels by the way, but the word angel means messenger. So when it says uh, give this message to the angel of the church of Ephesus, it means give it to the messenger or the minister of the church of Ephesus. Now I'm going to read this statement from Ellen White. It's found in the book uh, Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, pages 413 and 414. These things, she's quoting first of all Revelation 2 verse 1, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. The sweet influences that are to be abundant in the church are bound up with God's ministers who are to present the precious love of Christ. The stars of heaven are under the control of Christ. Now she's talking about the literal stars in heaven. They're under the control of Christ. He fills them with light. He directs their movements. If he did not do this, they would become fallen stars. What would happen if the ministers were not in the right hand of Jesus? They would become what? Fallen stars. She continues, so with his ministers, they are but instruments in his hand, and all the good they accomplish is done through his power. Through them his light is to shine forth. Through him, through Jesus, his light is to shine forth. Now, you know, you know Jesus once said, I am the light of the world. Didn't he say that? Yes. John 8 and verse 12. But then in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verses 14 through 16, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Now wait a minute, who's the light of the world? Is it Jesus or is it us? Well you notice what it says here, through them, that is through the ministers, his light is to shine forth. Let me give you an illustration. You go out on a clear night here in uh, Oklahoma, wherever you live in Oklahoma, and you see this beautiful big silvery full moon. And you look into the sky and you say, my how beautiful the moon is tonight. You know what, that's only a half truth because the moon is ugly. <laughs> Isn't the moon ugly? It's full of craters and full of mountains and everything. You know, it has no attractiveness whatsoever. But when the sun shines on the moon, the moon then projects the light of the sun to the earth. And so what we need to say is, how beautiful the sun is tonight. <laughs> because the light of the moon is the light of the sun. It receives the light and then gives the light. And that's exactly what we find here. Jesus is the light, but when Jesus shines on his ministers, his ministers then irradiate his light to others. She continues, it is to the honor of Christ that he makes his ministers greater blessings to the church through the workings of the Holy Spirit. Then are the stars of the world. The Savior is to be their sufficiency. If they will look to him as he looked to his Father, they will do his works. As they make God their dependence, he will give them his brightness to reflect to the world. There's the illustration of the sun and the moon. The sun has original light, its own light. The moon has derived light and sheds the light to the earth. Now you'll notice that it says that he holds the seven stars in his hand, in his right hand. Now that does not capture the strength of the verb. Really, if you look at this verb in the New Testament, you're going to find that it's more than just having in the hand. It is really grasping in the hand. So basically, Jesus is not only holding the seven stars, you know, where they can fall out of his hand. No, he is actually grasping or clenching the seven stars. He does not want any of them to be plucked out of his hand. This kind of reminds me of what Jesus said. He said, I know my sheep, and no one can what? and no one can pluck them out of my hand. And so it is with his ministers. 
You'll notice also that in the message to the church of Ephesus, Jesus praises their works and their labor. There's a long section there where Jesus praises the church of Ephesus because it's a hard working church. It is an active church. Now the word works that is used with regards to the church of Ephesus is the Greek word erga. It's the same word that is used by James in chapter 2 where he says that faith without works is dead. In other words, these works that Jesus praises the church of Ephesus for are works that are done because they have faith, because they have trust in the Lord. It's of active faith, a faith that works. You know, this faith is described, for example, in the book of Hebrews, which was written in the first century, the apostolic church. Have you ever noticed in Hebrews 11, the great chapter of faith, that everyone in that chapter is doing something, not only believing something, Abraham left Ur. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. Abel offered a sacrifice. Moses left Egypt. Noah built an ark. In other words, it's a faith that is active in works. That was the characteristic of the Ephesian church primarily at its very beginning. Incidentally, this word labor that is used her in, in regard, with regards to the church of Ephesus actually means missionary work under very difficult and extenuating circumstances. In other words, when it uses the word labor to describe what the Ephesians were doing, it's not talking only about you know, just some kind of easy work, it's talking about difficult missionary work. Now uh, let me read you a passage that uses this word labors in another context. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 to 27 describes the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Was the, was the Apostle Paul a uh, missionary? Oh he's a tremendous missionary. Did he have great faith? Oh yeah, he had a faith that worked. He went out and he testified about Jesus no matter what it might cost to him. And he describes these labors, the same word for labor that is used with regards to the church of Ephesus, the Apostle Paul uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 23 to 27. This is how it reads. The Apostle Paul asks, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, same word that Jesus uses to praise Ephesus, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received forty stripes minus one, in other words thirty-nine. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the false brethren, in weariness and toil. There you find the same word again. This describes the, the, the type of labor that Ephesus was doing. Hard missionary labor under very difficult circumstances. So verse 27, in weariness and toil in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And then he says over and above this, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. In other words, Ephesus was working to the point of exhaustion to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to the entire world in that generation. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in Colossians, that in one generation the gospel then went to the entire known world because the church of Ephesus was a working church, a faith that worked, and it exercised hard labor. Incidentally, this word labor is also used in the parable of the workers of the vineyard in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 12 where you remember uh, some went out to work at 6 in the morning, others went out at 9, others went out at 12, others went out at 3, and then the last group went out at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and those who had worked the longest, uh, they complained, they said, man, we worked 
by the burden of the heat of the day. Once again the word burden is describing hard labor. But not only was the church of Ephesus a laboring church, not only was it a church that had good works that were produced by faith, the apostolic church or the church of Ephesus is also praised by Jesus for its patience. Now in the Greek language there are two words that are translated patience. One of them is the Greek word makrothumia, and the other one is the word hupomone. Now makrothumia in the Greek is translated in the King James Version long-suffering. You know that's a word that we don't use very much anymore. It means someone who is willing to bear suffering for a long, long time, long-suffering. That is not the word that Jesus uses to describe Ephesus. The word that he uses is the word hupomone. And what does hupomone mean? Hupomone actually means a patient perseverance. In other words, it is an active patience, not a passive patience where you say, well, you know, I'm going to suffer long, so I'll just, I'll just take the, the, you know, the stripes as they come. No, that's not the kind of patience that Jesus praises Ephesus for. He uses the word hupomone, which actually is translated endurance. It's translated perseverance. It's the same word that is used, for example, in Matthew 24 verse 13 where it says, He who endures till the end will be saved. In other words, this is describing a patience that doesn't have a good beginning and then fizzles out. This is a persevering patience. This is persistence and endurance. Is that the kind of experience that the early church had? Absolutely. It's a vivid description of the early church. And then the Apostle Paul also tells us in Hebrews 12 verse 1 that we need to run the race with patience. So once again the idea of patience, but it's an active patience. It's an enduring patience, a perseverant patience. You know it's the same word that is used in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 10 and Revelation 14 verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. It really means here is the perseverance of the saints. And it's used in the context of Revelation 13 and Revelation 14. It's talking about the final crisis of God's people. And it's introduced by saying here is the perseverance, the endurance of the saints, the, the persistence of the saints because we are going to need that like the early church had. Now Jesus also extols the church of Ephesus for the fact that it could not tolerate evil. In other words the early church rejected evil. The church had very low tolerance for any kind of evil. They were really strong against individuals who attempted to teach heresy in the church. They were watchmen in other words. Jesus is the great watchman but they were the instruments of Jesus to make sure that the church was kept pure, that doctrinal orthodoxy, orthodoxy was kept. And the reason for this is because the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20 verses 28 to 30 that after his departure raving, raving wolves would come in among the flock and they would not spare the flock. So the Apostle Paul was very careful to preserve the orthodoxy, the doctrinal orthodoxy of the church. In fact the Apostle Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 a church member that was committing incest in the church and he says, I deliver this man to the devil. Wow! What strong terminology the Apostle Paul used. He said, we cannot tolerate evil in the church. We cannot tolerate heresy in the church. In fact, the early church was uh, composed of watchmen who kept the purity of the church and also of light bearers who brought people into the church. Now Jesus also says to the church of Ephesus that the church of Ephesus suffered for His name's sake. Now as we go to other texts in the New Testament we find an amplification of what this means. Did the members of the church of Ephesus suffer greatly because of proclaiming the message? 
Yes, they had to hide. They were persecuted. Some of them were killed in the Roman Colosseum. They had to persevere. And they did it all in the name of Jesus, for the glory of the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 41, we are told that Peter and John considered it a privilege to suffer shame for the name. In Acts 15 verse 25, we are told that those who preached the gospel risked their lives for the name. And Acts 21 and verse 13 tells us that those who preached the gospel were willing to die for the name. You know, it's a serious thing to bear the name of Jesus. And I'm talking about really bearing the name. I'm not talking about those individuals who have the name and say, Lord, Lord, and cast out demons, and uh, perform miracles, and give prophecies, but their lives contradict the life of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about those individuals who are willing to give up their lives to exalt and praise the name of Jesus. You know, Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, said, the more they mow us down, the more we are. Yeah. The blood of Christians is seed. You know, when people saw Christians in the Colosseum with absolute peace, and the lions were released, and they were not screaming and shouting, oh, save us. No, they were willing to suffer for the name. Many saw them and they said, you know what? There must be something in this religion which is worthwhile. They're willing to die for it. And so people would do research, they would find out what is it that these people have that would be willing to uh, allow them to give up their lives for the name. And many of them, because of the martyrdom of these individuals, they became Christians. But then comes the rebuke of Jesus. A lot of praise, especially in the early stages of the apostolic church, the early stages of the church of Ephesus. But Jesus then rebukes them and he says, you have left your first love. Now if they left their first love, it's because they had it in the first place, right? So as the church goes along, towards the end of this period, the church begins to lose its first love. Now we can use the illustration of marriage for this. You know, I have been married, this year will be 47 years years. Amen. That is a long time. Amen. That is longer than many of you have lived. And I'll tell you what, I love my wife just as much or more today than I loved her when we got married. Amen. I have not lost the first love. But the church of Ephesus was losing the first love. Let me ask you, isn't it really a common thing that a couple gets married, they're all gung-ho, you know, they have the hair honeymoon, they have this great time together, and then in the course of time they fail to communicate, they fail to talk to each other, they fail to do these niceties one to another, and as a result what happens with love? Love begins to grow cold. The church of Ephesus was married to Christ, spiritually speaking, but because of its hard work and its action all the time, it lost its connection with Jesus. Yes, it did preserve doctrinal orthodoxy. Yes, it did not permit evil to come into the church, but in the process of this hard labor, they began losing their connection with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In working to the point of exhaustion, there was a real and present danger that the church would lose its vital connection with Jesus. This brings to my mind the story of Mary and Martha. You remember the story of Mary and Martha? Martha was a worker, wasn't she? She was out there in the kitchen. And she was cooking the, I don't know what country you're from, the enchiladas and the, and the tacos and the mashed potatoes for those of you who are Americans and the veggie meats. She was cooking all of these things, cooking up a storm for Jesus, cleaning the house and making sure that everything was in order. And there was Mary, lazy Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said, Mary has chosen the best part. She has chosen the connection with me as the best part. So working to advance the gospel is important. And preserving the doctrinal orthodoxy of the church is important as well. 
but never at the expense of a personal connection and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the very next verse, after it says that Ephesus has lost its first love, Jesus now tells them what they need to do to remedy that situation. He says, remember from where you fell. Remember from where you fell. You know, I was in Costa Rica several years ago, and uh, it was nighttime, and uh, there were, I was staying in a row of apartments there at our university, and uh, it was dark, and so I got out. I had to go to preach. I was going directly to the platform, and here I was walking, and I didn't know that there was a, there was a small stair there that raised uh, the, you know, the, the sidewalk from one place to another, and lo and behold, I'm coming full steam to get to preach, and boom, I tripped over that. You know, I broke my glasses, you know, my, my, my face was scratched, and I, and I had to preach. I'll tell you one thing, I'll never fall again in that same place, because I remember where I have fallen from. And that's what Jesus is saying to the church of Ephesus. He's saying keep, by the way, it's not remember where you've fallen from. The verb is keep remembering. It's a present progressive verb. Keep remembering from where you fell so that you do not fall again. Take precautions. And then Jesus stated, repent. He says, remember where you fell from, and then he says, repent. What does the word repentance mean? It means to make a U-turn. It means you're going in one direction, you turn around, and you go in the opposite direction. Was Ephesus going in the wrong direction at the end of its period? Absolutely. So Jesus says, make a U-turn and go back to where you came from. You know, I remember several years ago, um, I was uh, going to a certain location, and my wife was with me. And um, I took a road, and I was driving down the road. My wife says, you know, this is, not, this is not the road that takes us there. I said, oh, yes, it is. You know, husbands know everything. So I, yeah, yeah, it, it, it is, it is. I'm sure where I'm going. So I drove about a half an hour, and then after about a half an hour, I said, this doesn't look familiar. So I decided to look at the map, and lo and behold, I was going in exactly the opposite direction. So I had to make a U-turn and come back to where I started. That's what, re that's what repentance is. It's turning around. It's, it's not doing what you were doing before. It's returning to what Ephesus was doing in the good old days, if you please. You see, at the beginning, Ephesus worked very hard. They worked very hard because they had faith. And they also loved the brethren. It came from the heart. But at the end, it became a formality. It became more legalism than a thing of love. Incidentally, Repentance does not mean that you are sorry for the consequences of what you did. It means you are sorry for what you did. Amen. You know, I remember when I was growing up, I would fight with my sister sometimes. Actually, they fought with me, but anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and my parents, you know, they always sided with my sisters, as I remember they said, now, son, they're girls. You need to treat your, girl, your, your uh, sisters with respect. And then my father would show me the belt. He would say, I'm going to give you a spanking, which is the word that was used. You know what I said to my dad? Oh, no, dad, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Do you really think I was sorry about fighting with my sisters? Not on your life. I was sorry I was going to be punished. In other words, that was not repentance, because it was not an intention to change the wrong thing that I was doing, it was actually being sad for the consequences that my action would produce. So Jesus says, make a U-turn. Go back to where you began. Yes, work hard, preserve doctrinal, doctrinal orthodoxy. Yes, keep evil from coming into the church, but do it out of love. Do it out of faith with the true motivation. So then Jesus says, do the first works. So notice, what is the remedy for losing the first love? It's going back and doing what? And doing the first works. In other words, working not in order to earn salvation, not working just to show how hard you're working, but working 
because of love that flows from the heart. And then Jesus tells the church of Ephesus, listen folks, if you do not make a U-turn, if you don't remember where you have fallen, so you can go back to the beginning, if you don't repent, I am going to do something drastic. This is, a, this is one of the most drastic rebukes that Jesus gives to the church of Ephesus. He says, I am going to remove the light. I'm going to remove your candlestick. And you will no longer fulfill my will. I will go on to another church that will do it. So Jesus says, you better shed the light. You better accept my counsel or I will remove your candlestick. Now also in connection with the church of Ephesus, you have a group that are called the Nicolaitans. You say, who are those? Well, if we are to believe Hippolytus, who was one of the uh, church fathers, and Irenaeus, they tell us that Nic the Nicolaitans were heretical followers of a man called Nicholas. And they said that Nicholas was one of the first deacons. He's mentioned in Acts chapter 6 and verse 5. In other words, this would mean that Nicholas, even though he was one of the first seven deacons that were ordained, uh, he apostatized from the faith and he began teaching heresy. And it says there that Ephesus hated the Nicolaitans. In other words, they did not accept their message, they hated them. Now, what did the Nicolaitans teach? We're going to talk more about this because when we get to the church of Pergamum, the Lord says, you tolerate the Nicolaitans. Interesting, there's a shift from rejecting them and hating the Nicolaitans to actually not rejecting them but tolerating them. And we will discuss that when we talk about the church of Pergamum. What did the Nicolaitans teach? They taught a radical dualism between the body and the soul. In other words, they embraced Greek philosophy that the soul is separate from the body. And basically what they taught is that whatever you do with the body cannot contaminate your soul. So you can do whatever you want with your body and that's not going to defile your soul. So you don't have to keep the law, you can basically do as you please. In other words, they attack the law of God through this false theology. And of course the church of Ephesus openly rejected this. Now Ellen White has an interesting comment about the Nicolaitans. Listen to this. This is found in the Bible Echo, February 8, 1897. She's now saying that there are many in these days that have the same philosophy of the Nicolaitans in the period of the Apostolic Church. This is how it reads. Those who are teaching this doctrine today, oh so there are a few that are teaching this doctrine today, have much to say in regard to faith and the righteousness of Christ, but they pervert the truth and make it serve the cause of error. They declare that we have only to believe in Jesus Christ and that faith is all sufficient, that the righteousness of Christ is to be the sinner's credentials, that this, that this imputed righteousness fulfills the law for us and that we are under no obligation to obey the law of God. Does that sound familiar? Ah, we're not under law, we're under grace. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So uh, you know they, they say the same thing as those who were trying to infiltrate the early church. She continues, this class claims that Christ came to save sinners and that He has saved them. I am saved, they will repeat over and over again, but are they saved? while transgressing the law of Jehovah? No, for the garments of Christ's righteousness are not a cloak for iniquity. Such teaching is a gross deception, and Christ becomes to these persons a stumbling block as did to the Jews. To the Jews, because they would not receive Him as their personal Savior. To these professed believers in Christ, because they separate Christ and the law and regard faith as a substitute for obedience. They separate the Father and the Son, the Savior of the world. Virtually they teach both by precept and example that Christ by His death saves men 
in their transgressions. Quite a description, isn't it? And then comes the promise of Jesus to the church of Ephesus. If the church of Ephesus remembers where it fell, fell from, if it also uh, exercises faith and it returns to its first works, Jesus gives a glorious promise. He says, to him who overcomes. The Greek word overcome is uh, the word nikao, and basically it means to gain the victory or to conquer. The New Testament uses this word in other places to describe a struggle that ends in victory. In Revelation, it is a present participle. If you're up, uh, you know, if you're up on your English grammar, it's a present participle, which means that really it should be translated, he who continues to overcome, he who continues to gain the victory. What is the promise to those who continue to gain the victory, who go to the first works, who return to their first love? What is the promise that Jesus gives? He says that they will be able to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Now, it's interesting that the word paradise is used in three places in the New Testament. It's used in Revelation 2 verse 7, which is the passage that we're studying, uh, where it says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him the privilege of eating from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It's used also in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4, where the Apostle Paul says that in vision he was caught off to the third heaven. By the way, was Ellen White caught, off, caught up to the third heaven in vision? Oh yes, she was uh, given the privilege of going into the heavenly sanctuary, visiting the heavenly sanctuary, and seeing things that were occurring in heaven. So the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 4, he says, you know, in vision, he says whether I was in the body or out of the body, that doesn't mean that uh, you can go out of your body. What it means, I don't know if it was in person that I was taken to heaven or whether in my mind I was taken to heaven. So he, he says that he was taken to the third heaven where paradise is. And then of course, the third time this word, is you, this word paradise is used is when Jesus promised to the thief on the cross, verily, verily, I say unto you, today, you will be with me in paradise. And of course, you know, Christians in different churches have said, well, you know, uh, paradise uh, is some intermediary place where people will kept in uh, suspended animation until Jesus died on the cross and then they were taken to, from paradise to heaven. Well, that is not a biblical teaching because the Bible tells us very clearly that paradise is where the tree of life is. It's not some intermediary place. Paradise is where the tree of life is, and book, the book of Revelation tells us that the tree of life is before the throne of God in the New Jerusalem. And so paradise is the place where God abides, and eating from the tree of life will be the great privilege. And let me say something about the tree of life. You know, at the beginning, Adam and Eve had to continue eating from the tree of life. It wasn't sufficient to eat just once. They had to go on a regular basis to eat from the tree to continue charging their battery, so to speak. And uh, you know, you say, well, well, how do you know that? Well, because God barred them from eating from the tree of life. How long did people before the flood live? Almost a thousand years. Why? Because they had an almost fully charged battery. But as time goes by, what happens to the battery? If Jesus didn't come, what would happen with the human race? The human race, eventually, the battery would run out and everybody would cease to exist. I believe that Adam and Eve had to go and eat from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden every month. And you say, why is that? Because in the book of Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 2, it says that God's people will go every month to eat from the tree of life. In other words, God, Jesus is saying to the church of Ephesus, if you follow my counsel, you will go to the paradise of God where the tree of life is found and you will have the privilege to continue eating from month to month of the tree of life and recharge your battery and you will never die again. What a glorious promise Jesus gives 
to his church, to the church of Ephesus, to the church of the apostles. The church that went well as long as the apostles were alive, but towards the end of its career began having all sorts of problems. Let me ask you, does the message to the church of Ephesus speak to us as well? Yes. You know, it's interesting, uh, with regards to the seven churches, this is an important point. Sometimes Ellen White will take counsel that is given to Ephesus and she will use it for Laodicea. Sometimes she will take verses that speak about Laodicea and she'll apply them to Pergamum. Now it's not that, that she's saying that, uh, you know, the, the, the periods overlap. What she's saying is that there, in each church there are individuals who have the characteristics of other churches. But the general tenor of the church is what is described in the seven churches. Most people are in that condition, even though there are individuals that have characteristics from other churches. Now I want to finish by reading a rather long statement from Ellen White about the church of Ephesus. This succinctly is going to put it in context for us. Volume 6 of the Testimonies 421 and 422. At first, the experience of the church of Ephesus was marked with childlike simplicity and fervor. A lively, earnest, heartfelt love for Christ was expressed. The believers rejoiced in the love of God because Christ was in their hearts as an abiding presence. See, had their connection with Jesus. The praise of God was on their lips and their attitude of thanksgiving was in accord with the thanksgiving of the heavenly family. Wouldn't you like to belong to a church like that? That's why Ephesus means desirable. She continues, the world took a knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Sinful men, repentant, pardoned, cleansed, and sanctified were brought into partnership with God through His Son. The believers sought earnestly to receive and obey every word of God. Filled with the love for their Redeemer, they sought as their highest aim to win souls to Him. They did not think of hoarding the precious treasure of the grace of Christ. They felt the importance of their calling and, and waited with the message, peace on earth, goodwill to men. They burned with desire to carry the glad tidings to the earth's remotest bounds. So you see why Jesus appraises the church as a working church, a church of labor, a church that, whose faith was shown by its works. She continues, the members of the church were united in sentiment and action. Love for Christ was the golden chain that bound them together. They followed on to know the Lord more and still more perfectly and brightness and comfort and peace were revealed in their lives. They visited the fatherless and widows in their affliction, affliction and kept themselves unspotted from the world. In other words, they did not tolerate sin. A failure to this, in other words, to do this, unspotted from the world, in their view have been a con would have been a contradiction of their profession and a denial of their Redeemer. In every city, the work was carried forward. Notice the emphasis on work. The work was carried forward. Souls were converted and in their turn felt that they must tell of the inestimable treasure. They could not rest till the beams of light which had illumined their minds were shining upon others. Multitudes of unbelievers were made acquainted with the reason of the Christian's hope Warm, inspired, personal appeals were made to the sinful and erring, to the outcast, and to those who, while professing to know the truth, were lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Does that sound like a church that you would like to belong to? Wow! Workers love Jesus, love souls so much that they work day and night to win souls to Jesus. But now she's going to describe what happened in the latter part of the history of the Apostolic Church. She wrote, But after a time, the zeal of the believers, their love for God and for one another, began to wane. Coldness crept into the church. Differences sprang up. And the eyes of many 
were turned from beholding Jesus as the author and finisher of their faith. The masses that might have been convicted and converted by a faithful practice of the truth were left unwarned. Then it was that the message was addressed to the Ephesian church by the true witness. Their lack of interest in the salvation of souls, notice this, they lost interest in what? So were they a working church at the beginning? Yes. Did they lose the zeal to win souls, to do evangelism? Yes. Does that have a message for us? Most certainly. She continues, their lack of interest in the salvation of souls showed that they had lost their first love. What is the evidence that you have lost your first love? The fact that you have lost love for your fellow human beings and you're not sharing the message of Christ's love with them. So once again, their lack of interest in the salvation of souls showed that they had lost their first love. For none can love God with the whole heart, mind and soul and strength without loving those for whom Christ died. God called upon them to repent and do the first works or else the candlestick would be removed out of its place. Why would the candlestick be removed out of its place? Because it was not fulfilling its what? It was not fulfilling its function. So this is the church of Ephesus. Is that the church that you would desire to belong to at least in a good part of its history? Yes. Absolutely. But already towards the end it was beginning to lose that spirit, to lose the love and the faith that the church had at the very beginning. Now God had a way of taking care of that problem and that was by allowing persecution to arise. Persecution would now purify the church and once again would make it a witnessing church. And so now we enter into the period of the second church, which we will study in our next presentation, the church of Smyrna. There's much death language in the church of Smyrna. People are being martyred right and left by the Roman emperors. And yet Jesus gives glorious promises to the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church by the Roman emperors. And so in our next study, we are going to take a look at the church of Smyrna, the church that was persecuted by the Roman emperors. And we're going to notice a 10 day tribulation period which actually represents 10 years during the period of Diocletian the emperor. But that we will save for our next study together. God bless each of you and may this be a blessing to us.